Yes. The Ukrainian Defense Forces withdrew from Solidar. The Bakhmut defense continues. Good afternoon, this is Henry Keane explaining the hardest of things and easiest of times for you here on UATV channel. Ukrainian soldiers fulfilled the task said by the command to exhaust the enemy, not to let the Russians break through front and enter the operational space. Solidar's defenders retreated to the pre-prepared lines of echelon defense of the Donetsk Oblast. The advance of the Russian troops costs the enemy enormous human losses, six to 700 KIA daily, while the Ukrainian command gathers and preserves resources for the future counteroffensive. The Russian command is trying to achieve no military but the political goal set by the Kremlin to reach the administrative borders of the Donetsk Oblast by the anniversary of the full-scale aggression, the first and failed deadline for achieving this goal was May 9th last year. Meet Pyrrhus. His original Pyrrhic victory came courtesy of Pyrrhus of Epirus, a Greek king who was undone by his costly battles against the Romans at Asclum City. He arrived with a force of some 25,000 men and 20 war elephants, the first the Roman legionaries had ever faced, and immediately scored a famous victory in his first battle at Heraclea. The following year, he bested the Romans a second time during a heated clash at Asculum. Pyrrhus fancied himself a latter-day Alexander the Great, and he'd hoped his invasion would give his empire a foothold in Italy. But while he'd wrote to the Romans at both Heraclea and Asculum, he had lost more than 7,500 of his most elite fighters, including many officers. Pyrrhus' failure to deal the enemy death blow sent morale plummeting within his ranks. And so he said, if we are victorious in one more battle with the Romans, we shall be utterly ruined. Solidar is the only city Russia has taken by now from the beginning of autumn. And at what cost? What if I'll say that strategically Kiev outsmarted Moscow simply because we are guided solely by the military and not by the political logic of conducting hostilities? Would you agree to me, dear world? Or would you laugh at me and say, oh, Henry, you are so Ukrainian. Russian has taken Solidar and that means you have lost it. Well then, for those of you who might say this, take a closer look at what Russian had taken. Solidar is a ground zero. This is a present for the Kremlin monster, something to report as a victory in particular. What is most absurd and mind-boggling about Russian warfare against Ukraine in general, though, is to observe how the Soviet spirit and those are nothing but the troops of the Soviet empire which invaded our country absolutely neglects life. Any life. Their own life, ours, men, women, children, villages, cities, international reputation, country, past, future, economy. The whole nation was brought to sacrifice at the first command of their dictator, maddened by impunity. Have no doubt, dear world. If only has the slightest chance, the Soviet spirit will do the same to you what it did to Solidar, to Bucha, to Izum, to Borodyanka. It will rain, even the ruins, just to rain, rain at any cost. This morbid imperial obsession is exactly what we are fighting against here in Ukraine. And since we are at war, why not to use enemy's flaws and not to turn into a weapon against himself? And that, dear world, is exactly what happened in Solidar. Amsterdam, January 25th. The European Court of Human Rights announces that cases brought by Ukraine and the Netherlands against Russia over alleged human rights violations in the breakaway Lugansk and Donetsk regions of Ukraine and the shooting down of flight MH17 are admissible. The decision does not rule on the merits of the cases, but it does show the Strasbourg-based court considers Russia can be held liable for human rights violations. Among other things, the court found that areas in eastern Ukraine in separatist hands were from 11th May 2014 and up to at least 26 January 2022, under the jurisdiction of the Russian Federation, the court said in a ruling on Wednesday. The European Court of Human Rights has confirmed Russia's involvement in the donning of the flight MH17, an important milestone and the first time that the International Court has ruled on this matter. This is a clear signal to Russia, Wopke Hoekstra, Dutch Foreign Minister on Twitter. Oh dear Dutch Minister Hoekstra, whatever the signals are, Russia won't react. 
The reason is the same. It has always been for Soviet Russian diplomacy. They just don't give a fuck. Two years ago, Russian lawless makers, in a session of the lower house of the state parliament, passed a pair of bills ending the European Court of Human Rights jurisdiction in their country. The bills were passed near unanimously, with only one deputy from the Communist Party voting against. I mean, this is hilarious. An unknown communist had a balls to protest the Soviet Putin's madness gaining momentum. Despite Putin's maniacal delusions, the court confirmed the facts of the Russian occupation of Crimea since February and the east of Ukraine since May 2014 and will investigate human rights violations by Russia there. Organizational processes are underway to create a special international tribunal which will try the senior leadership of Russia for the crime of aggression. The concept of the tribunal was supported by the European Parliament and several countries. The International Criminal Court in The Hague will also investigate Russian crimes within its competence. Like, for example, in 2017, the court ordered Moscow to pay compensation to survivors of the hostage crisis who alleged failings on the part of the security services when they stormed a school seized by Islamic militants in 2004. The siege in the town of Beslan ended in a bloody gun battle in which more than 330 hostages died, including at least 180 children. This is the way Moscow frees hostages, kills them alongside the terrorists. Also, the UN General Assembly confirmed the legitimacy of recovering reparations from Russia for aggression. You see, a lot is on the international judiciary agenda these days, and nothing of its contents is even somewhat promising to Russia, which already makes it a promise to a civilized world. And one more thing very much worth mentioning. The Wagner PNC has already been recognized as a criminal organization and now has its level up, or rather said level down. Wagner is on the verge of being recognized as a terrorist organization by Washington, which opens the way to signing the status of a state sponsor of terrorism to Russia itself. All these processes are interrelated and led the Kremlin regime to the dock, where it will have to answer for all the crimes committed. And we at UATV just can't wait to be at that dock, dear world, to report. German Chancellor Olaf Scholz announced the decision after weeks of reluctance and international pressure, leopards are going to Ukraine. Chancellor Scholz announced the decision to send 14 tanks and allow other countries to send theirs to at a cabinet meeting on Wednesday. The United States and Germany had resisted internal and external pressure to send their tanks to Ukraine for some time. Washington cited the extensive training and maintenance required for the high-tech Abrams. Germans endured months of political debate about concerns that sending tanks would escalate the conflict and make NATO a direct party to the war with Russia. And then... If the Germans continue to say we will only send or release Leopards on the conditions that Americans send Abrams, we should set Abrams. Chris Kunz, U.S. Democratic Party senator. I personally like this guy. And so, United States sends us at least 30 M1 Abrams tanks. Also, quite a great Britain how will send challenges too, thanks to Ukraine. Uh, the goal is to be able to deliver as quickly as possible. That's why the 2A6 is the right choice. Firstly, because it is the most powerful unit currently available. We have the stocks of ammunition. We can ensure the maintenance and also the training, which is logically somewhat more costly on the LEO-1. For the clarification, work is in progress. Today I am announcing that the United States will be sending 31 Abram tanks to Ukraine, the equivalent of one Ukrainian battalion. Secretary Austin has recommended this step because it will enhance the Ukraine's capacity to defend its territory and achieve its strategic objectives. And what Russia says on all that? Peskov says there was an overestimation of the potential the tanks would bring to the Ukrainian army and called the move a failed plan. A failed plan is not this. A failed plan. I mean, ain't that beautiful? A Tsar's servant calls a failed plan world's reaction to Russia's crime of aggression against Ukraine. Peskov does not call this 
Enormous figures of Russian army losses, a failed plan. No 6,700 soldiers killed near Bakhmut daily. And that is equal to two Chechen wars in a row is a failed plan, according to Peskov. I wonder then what is a failed plan? Is Putin's plan, what was it, to take Ukraine in three days, a failed plan? What's in regard to not too creative, as usual, the case with Kremlin is attempts to quarrel Ukrainians and Hungarians living in the Karpatia region of Ukraine. The Kremlin assures you, dear world, that the head of the Hungarian foreign ministry, Piotr Sciarto, said that the Zakarpatian Hungarians are mobilized into the Ukrainian army against their will. According to the Kremlin, most of them die. Is it just me? Or someone in Russia just copy-pastes them narratives of PMC Wagner and Minsk mercenaries' behavioral pattern. The Kremlin claims that Siarto called the mobilization among the representatives of the Hungarian diaspora living in Ukraine another reason why Budapest sits on peace talks. The Kremlin itself heard how, at a meeting of the UN Security Council in New York, Siarto noted that the Hungarians understand the need for peace talks like no one else, because the war in Ukraine is taking place directly with the territory of neighboring country. And the Kremlin also heard Siarto mentioning that more than a million Ukrainian refugees had crossed the Ukrainian-Hungarian border since the Russian military invasion began. And he also called economic sanctions against the Russian Federation unsuccessful. Not to mention the fact that Hungarians are dying in this war side by side with Ukrainians because Hungarians living in Zakarpatia are also being drafted into the Ukrainian army. The minister, according to the Kremlin, said. We, that is the Kremlin and the minister probably, have seen video footage of how brutal it sometimes is. Oh dear, dear world, I could have given you now like 50 reasons to convince you this fake is a fake. But let me introduce you to someone who needs only one reason to do it. Normally, he works at Ushgurit University. But when Russia invaded Ukraine, he enlisted in the army to protect his homeland, Ukraine. He does not want to leave his students and find a way to teach them. Meet Professor Fyodor Shandor of the University of Vyshgorod in Ukraine. I want to answer all Russian agents in Ukraine and Hungary who are spreading lies. The Carpathian Hungarians are respectable citizens of Ukraine. Thousands of Zakarpathian of all nationalities, including Hungarians, took up arms and went to fight. Because we do not want Russian invaders to come to Zakarpathia to kill our families. Fedor Shandor, Ushgorod National University professor. The purpose of this absurdly obvious provocation is, of course, to turn Hungarians and Ukrainians one against the other. But I would like to talk about something else tonight. I would very much like to remind us all of the difference between voluntary and forced patriotism. Are Ukrainian Hungarians a respectable citizens of Ukraine indeed? Indeed, People of Zakarpatia are people of multiple nationalities, including Hungarians, who voluntarily took up arms and went to the front line. The reason is simple. We, unlike the Russians, are a united nation. A nation that, unlike the Russians, does not invade a foreign land on the ill orders of its outdated emperor. A nation that, unlike the Russians, does not scatter around the world when the time comes to fight. A nation that, unlike the Russians, is fighting on its own land. A nation whose Hungarians remember what happened a century ago. Those concentration camps organized from them by Soviets. They remember all too well that Malinki Robot, the forced labor of Hungarians in the USSR in the post-World War II period is still remembered in Hungary under the name Little Robot. And today, descendants of those valiant Soviet soldiers invaded Ukraine. And today... Our Ukrainian Hungarians defend our land and our families from the Russian occupiers on the very front line. Now this is called voluntary patriotism. For those who betrayed their nation and flipped sides to serve Russia, I would like to say just one thing. This time the good and the truth will win and the Putin-Soviet-Russian evil will lose. And when the moment will come, when all of a sudden you will find yourself talking about love for Ukraine again, just mark my words, it won't be voluntary. And that makes a hell of a difference.
explained to you by Henry Kinn on UA TV channel, wrapping up hard things in easy terms for the whole free world directly from Ukraine. Stay safe and tuned for more.